Hello and welcome to our first Startup Women webinar of 2023, How Women-Led Change Funding is Changing the Game. I'm Isabel Nolan, I'm the Startup Women Programme here at Startup Canada. To begin, I would like to acknowledge that the land on which I am on today is located on the unceded and traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil nations. We also acknowledge with respect the diverse histories and cultures of all Indigenous peoples. I encourage you to take a moment uh, to acknowledge the traditional territory that you're residing on today. Um, we welcome you to connect with each other in the chat. Make sure that you're sending your messages to everyone in the room. Zoom uh, tends to default messages to only send to the hosts and panelists. So just make sure you change that so that you're, you're talking to everyone. Today's session is being recorded and will be added to our YouTube channel and our Facebook page afterwards as a living resource. Before I continue with my opening remarks, um, I have a very quick poll that I'd like to launch just so we can get a sense of who's in the room. Um, the answers that you're submitting are anonymous um, and I'll share them on, on screen in a few moments, but it's just for us to kind of understand who's in the room. So, um, doo -doo -doo. all right, so you should see that pop up on your screen. So if you'd like to take a moment to complete that and I'll go through the, the rest of my opening remarks. I'll just move that actually. So for those of you who don't know who Startup Canada is, um, we're a national nonprofit that is the gateway to Canada's entrepreneurial ecosystem. We're here to connect entrepreneurs with the support, community and tools that they need to build a successful business in Canada. Since launching in 2012, Startup Canada has grown to support more, more than 130,000 entrepreneurs annually and an ever-growing community of ecosystem partners from coast to coast to coast. Startup Women is one of Startup Canada's flagship programs, and it's a series of free mentorship, advocacy, and education initiatives. This is our second year running this program annually, allowing for more women identifying entrepreneurs to be engaged and receive longer lasting support. Before we get started uh, into our discussion, I do have a short message from um, one of our co-presenting partners, the Scotiabank Women Initiative. I'll pick you next. The Scotiabank Women Initiative is dedicated to your success on your terms. I'm shaping our industry's vision for the future. I can expand my business without borrowing from my family. I know I can face anything thanks to my network. I'm ready for my next chapter. I'm inspiring future leaders. I'm making sure my family's future is secure. Define your success and we'll help you achieve it. With unbiased access to capital and tailored solutions, bespoke specialized education, and holistic advisory services and mentorship. Join our community of women today. The Scotiabank Women Initiative I would also like to thank our other co-presenting partner, UPS, our program partners, EDC and MasterCard, and our community of ecosystem partners, including North Forge, Invest Ottawa, WEC, the, she uh, the Sheepreneur Project, Northumberland Community Futures Development Corporation, Women's Enterprise Organizations of Canada, BDC, um, and that's them all. Sorry, I was going to uh, repeat one there. Um, so today's conversation is focused on women-led funding. There's a growing number of women-led investment funds in Canada that are specifically interested in funding women founders, a group of often grossly underinvested in, as we all know. Um, so Reacher shows that when a woman is at the table, a fund is twi twice as likely to invest in a women-led startup. Today's speakers are some of the women who sit at these funding tables. I'll introduce you to them shortly and discuss what role each of their um, funds plays in the ecosystem. And our goal today is uh, really for you to, to leave feeling more knowledgeable and prepared about the fundraising, fundraising process when seeking um, venture capital. So um, thank you for answering the poll. I'm going to end it now and I'll share the results on screen so speakers kind of have a sense of, of who has raised so some of you have some not yet but are um planning to in the future and then most of you are either personal investment or friends and family but there's some crowdfunding government grants loans some venture capital 
and quite a few of you have not raised yet. So hopefully you're here to maybe learn a little bit more about uh, this process um, and good to know some of the, um, the amounts there. Okay, thank you. So um, we have prepared some questions for the panelists. Um, however, if you do have a question throughout the conversation, uh, please feel free to either put it in the chat or the Q&A box, which you'll find on, on the um, bottom tab function bar, and we'll do our best to answer it live for you. So without further ado, I'm um, honoured to introduce our speakers today. We have Danielle, Danielle Graham, co-founder of the Firehood, Kathy Bennett, co-founder and managing partner at Sandpiper, and Kimberly Young, partner in uh, Thrive Venture Fund at BDC. So welcome speakers. Thank you so much for uh, for joining us today. I really appreciate you having you, uh, you here to uh, contribute to the conversation. Um, I'd love to invite each of you to introduce yourselves really um, and tell us a little bit more about your respective funds um, and how you're each doing things a little bit differently in these investment funds for the um, for the, the women entrepreneurs uh, in the Canadian ecosystem. Um, Kathy, maybe I can go to you first. Yeah, sure. Um, well, welcome everybody and uh, excited to spend a little bit of time with all of you, exciting uh, entrepreneurs who are out there listening uh, to the presentations today. Um, I'm a former entrepreneur. I started my first uh, business when I was in my 20s. Uh, so I spent about 35 years and grew the company into a, a suite of different companies and then uh, retired um, and then got bored and decided uh, one of the things that I was pretty passionate about was to solve the problem of access to capital for uh, women who are um, looking to create solutions in the innovation economy. So myself with two partners created Sandpiper Ventures, uh, which is a seed stage um, uh, venture capital uh, firm in uh, Canada. We are anchored in Atlantic Canada. Uh, we uh, established a pilot fund of about $20 million that's uh, um, rapidly being deployed um, over the last number of years. And uh, I think what I'll do is turn it over to, uh, uh, back to our moderator to uh, go to the other folks and let them introduce them, themselves and their funds. Um, and I'll share a little bit more Sandpiper story as we uh, answer some questions. Thank you so much, Kathy. Um, Kimberly, can I pass to, to you next? Sure, it's uh, nice to virtually see everyone here. I'm excited to, uh, like Kathy said, uh, uh, be here with you guys, with you all today. Um, Kim Young, I'm a partner um, at BDC Capital's Thrive Venture Fund and Women in Tech Venture Fund. Uh, the Thrive Venture Fund uh, was launched at the end of, or sorry, at the end of the fall last year. It's a $300 million direct investment fund uh, focused on women-led technology companies in Canada. Uh, we focus what we say seed to scale, so it's typically seed series A, B. Um, and, and just like sort of... Um, Kathy was saying just we we, we are uh, really excited about being in front of you all today and um and I'm sure we'll lots more to say after. Thank you so much and Danielle. Thanks so much. Yeah, lots of familiar names popping up in the chat over here. Uh, I've been part of the ecosystem since I graduated from my MBA in Waterloo. I founded Your Founders, the first female focused tech accelerator and spent a lot of my early career in the angel ecosystem with the local Waterloo Angel Network, which then led to spinning out Archangel. And so within Archangel, we have 20 million of assets under management, all from high net worth individuals. Part of that is allocated specifically to women and that's Phoenix Fire, um, which is a direct fund for women led by women. And then as we were building that fund and working with LPs, they really wanted to get more hands-on, involved, advise, and support founders directly with their own capital. And so that's where the Firehood uh, was born. And so we work directly with individual angels, offer training, and operate across Canada. Fantastic. Thank you so much for uh, introducing yourselves. Um, so for our attendees, today's conversation will be solely focused on um, these investment funds. Um, of course, there are many different ways that you can be fundraising. Um, and as you saw in, in the poll, you, know, you can do friends and family, crowdfunding, uh, grants. There's also debt funding. Um, so I just want to ensure that everyone's um, aware that the conversation will certainly be focused on this. But there are um, a variety of, of different ways that you could be um fundraising avenues really that you can be going down um, and we do we did do a, um, 
a webinar on sort of fundraising 101 on the various different avenues you can go down and um, that we can share and um, we did that event last year and um, so just want to kind of set expectations a little bit in case um uh, I attendees uh, weren't aware um, so Kathy, can I go back to you um, and talk a little bit more um, about the, the types of companies that you're um, funding? So I know that Sandpiper is one of the first venture funds in Canada investing in women-led companies at the seed stage. Can you explain, you know, what exactly is a seed stage um, and why you decided to fund businesses um, at, at that stage? Yeah, so there'll be lots of technical answers and I'm going to try to give you what I would say is the simplest answer. Um, seed capital is really used um, as part of the beginning of the idea of a business or the beginning of a new product. So um, for Sandpiper, we focus on scalable um, tech enabled uh, solutions that have uh, global potential. So if a company has, uh, a founder has an idea that is focused in kind of that category, um, we provide seed money to allow them to develop uh, business plans, to look at uh, developing prototypes, potentially to look at uh, developing first versions or beta test, uh, you know, platforms. Um, and it's all designed, um, seed capital is really designed to get you ready to go to market, not just with customers, which are your most important uh, stakeholders, but equally with other future investors um, that may want to um, invest in your company and that you may need to invest in your company to get to that uh, scalable objective that uh, we hope we're, we're, we're going to see from our founders that we partner with. And after securing that seed uh, financing, typically startups will approach, um, you know, uh, venture capitalists in general uh, to obtain additional financing. So you're kind of moving a little bit away from uh, the friends and family, or maybe you've had some angels and you're kind of upstreaming um, the, um, the folks that you're going to have conversations with about adding uh, capital to your company so that you can grow and expand. In seed, you know, you will find both angels and some firms like ours. Uh, really, those angels are, are typically, you know, professional investors who have very high net worths um, and are, you know, looking at making um, investments in companies that um, they can add value to. Uh, from Sandpiper's perspective, we cut checks um, for Fund One in the range of about three hundred and fifty to seven hundred and fifty thousand, and we reserve about sixty-five percent of the fund uh, for follow-on investing. We don't like to be in at least two rounds that uh, companies uh, are hopefully going to go through, and we want to support them through those two rounds to create uh, kind of the the value story that, uh, for future investors. Um, and also create um, you know, really good milestones that the companies can achieve that would increase the value in particular to the founder uh, for the company. I love that that you're yeah, investing more in just once and you're really guiding them through that process and ensuring that yeah, there's more of a, um, a runway for them as well in, in that funding. Um, Kim, um, can we talk a little bit about the, the Thrive Venture Fund? Um, you're also making direct investments to women and technology-based um, businesses at the seed stage, but also series A and series B. So similar to how I asked Kathy, can you maybe talk about, you know, what are the series A and series B stages? Um, and what are you looking for in entrepreneurs and, and, business, and companies that you invest in? So um, what we found, so the Thrive Venture Fund is um, our second fund. It's the, you know, the continuation of uh, our first fund, which was aptly named the Women in Tech Venture Fund, very, very obvious. Um, but what we saw was just an incredible pipeline of, of um, female entrepreneurs, um, women leaders of uh, building technology companies. And so um, put together the Thrive Venture Fund and um, we sort of follow on kind of where, where, Kathy, where Kathy sits. So when she mentioned um, Sandpiper invests pretty early on into, you know, the business plan and the formation of the business and, and really building out the product um, and, and scaling that. Uh, we often will come in just around that same time. Actually, we are uh, recently co-invested with, uh, we have a, a company together, so that's really exciting. Um, but, but typically for us, um, companies are a little further along in their journey. So when you think about uh, product market fit, customer traction, um, kind of revenue early on, which kind of um, 
is validating on all those factors um, and also starting to build and grow the team um, beyond maybe the four walls they're in or the four virtual walls that they're sitting in. Um, it's not dissimilar in many ways. Um, what we look for always first and foremost is that team. Um, fundamentally, that's who we're backing, right? We're backing the founders and we're backing the team that they're looking to build in their executive team. Um, that's one of the, the most important things for us alongside kind of a large market opportunity, um, a solution that's really um, uh, hitting a real big pain point in any specific industry or market. Um, but, th but those are really important. I think stage-wise, usually you're looking at companies making like doing probably um, a million plus in revenues at that point of a series A um, and raising um, larger rounds um, to Kathy's point, really, you know, putting fuel on the fire, if you will, um, in order to really um, expand and accelerate. Um, and those rounds will vary um, and typically what they look like, you know, series B rounds are obviously larger with companies usually doing like five plus million, um, what we see. Um, and we're quite flexible in terms of how we play as a fund. Um, we will lead, we will co-lead, we will uh, be part of a syndicate, um, but we're looking really, it's, it's really who the founders are um, and the team and what they're growing and, and really how they're attacking the market and how they've decided to go to market and sort of those early proof points along the way. Okay, interesting. I'll, I'm going to make a note on um, tapping more into or um, unpicking that a little bit more about, you know, who is... Um, running the the, the uh, business and maybe we can yeah, talk a little bit more about that. Um, but uh, Danielle, I'd also love to give you the opportunity to tell us a little bit more about the Firehood and uh, Phoenix Fire and the types of businesses that you're supporting with uh, your fund. Thanks, Elizabeth. And yeah, I'll kind of position myself as like the earliest stage of, of these investment vehicles. And so what we're looking at is sometimes pre-revenue, pre-product businesses in the, you know, early kind of friends and family angel rounds. And so even though we, you know, our first deal, BDC also co-invested, actually more than co-invested. So that was a, a great collaboration at Startup Fest with a company called Permolution. And so a lot of the places where we show up is at Startup Fest, Elevate, SAS North, tech conferences where we meet all of the female founders who are at those events. They pitch to our network of angels and it's always different angels too. So we're really bringing different perspectives to the table to see what they resonate with, who they respond to. You know, too few female perspectives have been brought to the table from an investment standpoint as well as a founder standpoint. And so those natural connections and fuel where different people would invest, especially in the early stages where it's so subjective and there's less metrics around how are they going to succeed? What are these opportunities? We're looking at disruptive innovations and you wanna see net new markets. And so a lot of the work that we've been doing is in those early stages. And so we also work very closely with incubators. So even if the founder isn't fully investment ready, we're working with them to support their investment readiness, their data room, their due diligence, all of their documentation in order to prep them. And so there's examples like Venture Labs Capital Investment Program and Tech Alliance's Idea Fund, where those preparatory documents can really help a founder make a difference in terms of the way that they're positioning their business for scale. And I think that's been where a huge gap has been for female founders in the earliest stages. And that will feed the pipeline for later stage companies and investors like BDC and Sandpaper. Mm. And yeah, and, and that's really why I, I brought you all here together today was because you are each um, uh, feeding different um, entrepreneurs, if you will, um, and helping along that, that journey to grow even, even more and more. Um, so thank you. Um, I see that we're getting a few questions in the Q&A box. Uh, we will get to them. Um, but Danielle, you talked about um, investment, um, investor readiness or investment readiness rather. Um, so I think it would be really great for us to take some time to talk about figuring out, you know, are you ready for investment and talking through the actual process of what it looks like to um, fundraise from um, each of your funds specifically. Um, so maybe we'll start off with talking about having a fundraising strategy. Um, Tanya, maybe I'll, I'll pass it over to you first. You know, what should entrepreneurs have prepared before they go? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of nuances. Uh, it is a steep learning curve for founders who are raising equity for the first time. And also I'll preface this by saying equity isn't for everyone, right? Um, it is kind of a, a more niche element. You want to make sure that if you are taking on equity, you re recognize that you're selling a part of your business 
And then you're setting yourself up in the long term to sell that business, either IPO, you know, a strategic exit, uh, different opportunities for follow on funding that can also enable investors to exit and liquidate their investments. So you're really setting yourself up for the long term with that. And you have to be aware of what that trajectory looks like. It doesn't mean that you have to know the future. It's really hard for founders to predict an exit. Um, but it's still a recognition and an alignment with your investors to say, this is what we're offering. Very different from debt and, and grants. And so when it comes to that investment readiness, just that awareness, that knowledge, that ex exposure, and then who are the kind of the people who know you the best, right? So a lot of the time, these early investors are people who have trust in you, right? So that's why they call it friends and family, sometimes friends, family, and fools. Um, but <laughs> Again, it's that risk-taking uh, stage. So as you're looking at growing your business, you're improving your milestones and you're hitting those targets, then you're de-risking the business. And then certain investors are more interested in those stages. So again, thinking about those first preparatory pieces, you want to have a, you know core documentation. So if you know the people and you have a friend who's willing to put in a million dollars, great. But that's not everyone's story. So you do have to build, you know, a proper pitch deck. And that I also consider part of that trust building exercise around like showing that you have a plan in place. What is your vision? Have you put in the work to make this make sense from a scalable model that someone will actually see a return from? And so building kind of that scope. And then it's really an investment readiness camp campaign. So building out FOMO, building out an opportunity, getting people excited about the deal. And ensuring that when you're pitching, you are, are ready to take those next steps, right? The first pitch is just to get that next meeting. Mm -hmm. And then from there, they're actually going to ask you for your documentation. So you want to have all of the pieces in place from a checklist standpoint. And um, and happy to share more of those types of resources. But I'll pass it on to my colleagues to, uh, to chat about what that looks like from their standpoint. Absolutely. Yeah, no, thank you, Danielle. Um, Kim, maybe I can uh, go to you next in terms of, you know, um, what would you be looking for uh, for entrepreneurs to be providing you um, in, in this process, at the beginning of the process anyway? Yeah, I think Danielle touched on a really great point, which was um, this is a journey and this isn't the first time we'll be talking to investors um, and different investors at different stages um, will require sort of different materials to your point. But, but I think more important, like even before that, it's who do you want to work with in the long run? Because they're going to be with you through the ups and the downs and like, and all that in between stuff that happens as you, you know, kind of make critical decisions. Um, you are taking other people's capital. So that's also uh, something to, to, to keep top of mind. But, but it also means um, you want to find a partner who's on the same page as you, who understands um, what your vision is. Um, but I think you also have to understand kind of like where you sit as a company and a founder within maybe their portfolio, right? And so there's a bit of, um, I think in the, uh, you know, fundraising strategy, if you will, thinking who are the, the best um, investors, funds, institutions, um, whoever they may be that, you know, what I'm doing, you know, really speaks to what they're looking for in an investment or in an opportunity. Um, and, and having kind of like a focus list will also help not just kind of just throw everything out there and just see what happens because um, any, any founder here who has gone through a fundraising process know it takes an incredible amount of time. Um, and it's time away from building the business. It's time away from talking to customers. It's time away from building product. Um, and so, your time is very precious. And so it's really important to, to really be focused in that way, right? To know who you want to go out with. And maybe there's different tiers, like in different groups, right? So this is like the, the really, really like your high priority uh, group of folks that you want to speak with first. And, you know, they all might have referrals and stuff, but it's, it's really important to be focused about that. It's kind of not dissimilar from when you go out looking for, you know, a job. You, you don't just like, or maybe some people have a strategy of just sending their resume everywhere, but it is also like your best bet is to have done your research on the company that you want to speak with, you know, kind of understand what their products, all that sort of stuff, what the role would entail. So um, it's that same um, sort of thoughtfulness if you put into that that work up front, um, while it does take work, I, I think really helps you because then you come prepared to speak with Kathy, Danielle, me, whomever, 
Um, and you know, you're like, oh, I know your portfolio. Like, oh, I've seen you've done this. Like, we're a really great fit. We're complimentary or whatever the case may be. Um, and that shows in a first meeting, right? That, that level of um, upfront work really, you can tell and you can then engage with that entrepreneur in a very different way than someone who's like, oh, can you tell me like what you do? And you're like, uh... <laughs> Okay. Like I already know a little bit of what you did, right? Because I, I have a meeting staff and I do my work. So um, so I think that is also from a first meeting uh, is really important to Danielle's point. Like that first meeting is just so that you entice the person to want a second meeting and to learn more, right? Because in that, you know, 30 minutes, an hour, whatever you get initially, um, at least from uh, our fund's perspective, that's not, we don't make a decision after one meeting, right? It's multiple meetings. We talk with our team you meet our team. It's so it's a, like I said, it's, it's, it's a bit of relationship building too. Um, the only other one point I'd add, and I think Kathy will have a lot to say just generally, so I don't want to take away time is um, sometimes you can just get to know investors before you actually need to fundraise. Um, and I think there's a lot of value to that. Um, they may not be people who end up investing in a future round or round of financing, but they might be great folks to pick their brains on network, connect you to other people, um, provide advice. And so um, I think going into meeting with investors without having, to, without being at the point where you need to fundraise is sometimes really beneficial too, because everybody knows we're just here to have a conversation and, and learn about each other. So that's sometimes a nice way to start a relationship as well. Yeah. And Kathy, before I get to you, um, I, Kim, I believe it was yourself when we had our speaker call last week, you said, or maybe it was, sorry, maybe it was in the other speakers, but um, one of you said, um, you know, you shouldn't be investing when you need money. You should really start that process before you need um, money. So you can allow yourself the time to build these relationships with these potential investors um, and, and sort of, yeah, build up the, the trust there. Um, Kathy, do you have anything to add to, uh, to, to this piece? Yeah, I think, you know, when you meet two things, um, uh, it's very much like dating and marriage, right? That's what you're trying to accomplish simultaneously. Um, so it's never too early to start building relationships with um, essential investors that you feel you want in your company. Um, you're going to end up uh, pitching likely to investors that you probably don't want to have uh, enter your company, but you will likely, um, you know, assess those uh, those for a different filter. But the folks that you really want to attract, and the folks that are strategic investors who are going to help bring value add, like a lot of operator experience, or they're going to bring value add by international networks. Um, those folks, you should really want to build those relationships in, over the long run. The, the second bit of advice. Um, I, I just add is that the pitch itself uh, deserves to be practiced. Uh, you're investing a huge amount of yourself in your companies as founders. Um, you're going to work on a beautiful deck. You're going to make sure that you're answering, you know, certain questions. Um, you know, what's the total addressable market? What's the problem you're trying to solve? What are you going to do with the money that we're going to invest in you? What are the things that you're hoping to achieve? You know, if that money is invested and what milestones. So you're going to answer some questions. But if you don't give yourself a little bit of time to also get really comfortable with the words, the, the, the disappointment sometimes is that we don't get to see the real you. We get to see the very nervous, the very kind of apprehensive you. And your business deserves, um, um, you know, some practice time so that you can actually present in a way that you're comfortable. We work really hard at Sandpiper to actually ditch the pitch um, because we want to make sure that founders are having a relationship conversation with us. We want them to get to get to know us as much as we want to get to know them. Um, but it's certainly, you know, you, you owe it to yourself to, you know, spend some time on making sure that you're as ready as you can be. Because as um, our colleagues have said on the panel, um, fundraising is uh, hard. It's going to take more uh, asks to get a few yeses. And, uh, you know, putting that time and effort into prepping, I think, makes a big difference. Absolutely. And I was just about to recommend um, an organization that I'm very familiar with, Volition. Um, but their co-founder, Melanie, is already in the chat um, talking about um the that kind of support that they also provide is is helping entrepreneurs um, with the, those um, pitches that you're talking about, Kathy. Um, so highly recommend uh, checking them out. Um, 
thank you all for for going through that that strategy um and really what entrepreneurs should have um sort of checklisted before they're um going into this this process um so I'm going to go off script a little bit and go into our audience uh, questions. Um, so I have one person in Val um, asking, can you please talk more about seed stage investment? I keep getting advice that I must have a working minimum viable product and um, with hundreds of users before any investor will be willing to invest. Um, their solution is fintech. Um, uh, releasing it to hundreds of users requires significant cyber capabilities. So any advice um, on that on that piece? I'll throw it out to anyone. Yeah, I mean, just quickly, I, I suggest that um, take a look at the folks that you're talking to and research whether or not they actually invest um, in companies that are, uh, you know, pre viable product as you described it in your your message i think you know what some, sometimes we do is we get no's from folks that wouldn't invest us in the first place because you, you know the companies don't meet the investment theses so the research that you do early on to understand um you know as as kim said earlier what kind of companies the investors invest in makes a huge difference because i'm not sure sometimes that a no is a no a no might be it's no not for us and that doesn't mean it's a no uh, for everybody Hmm. Great point. And um, Danielle, Kim, do you have anything to, to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I mostly work with um, uh, B2B versus B2C. So um, less familiar with all of the kind of direct consumer metrics and users. I would say there's there's more variance on the VC side at the seed stages than Series A. That's certainly where, you know, there's expectations around revenue, revenue growth, gross margins, LTV to CAC, like all those ratios, you should look them up, you should know what every acronym means. And, and it really is understanding kind of where, where the growth is taking place, where the opportunity and how much you've validated. So if you're able to paint a picture and build the credibility through your own um, experience as a team, the way that you validated that the product is, is um, going to be viable in market and differentiated from the competition, the more likely investors are to come in early and understand that viability. So if they're asking for more metrics, it means that in some ways you haven't completely convinced them that this is a viable opportunity and that there's a growth opportunity there. Um, and then just from a broader standpoint, they are looking for you know that opportunity for follow-on funding. So it's not only about this round, it's about future rounds and what do those metrics look like and are you on track? Fantastic. Thank you, Danielle. And Val, I hope that that uh, answers your question. Um, I'm conscious of regarding, we're getting a few questions in the chat and the Q&A, so I do want to ensure that we get to all of them. Um, Adina is asking, um, what approach uh, would any of you recommend if your BMC or pitch deck has the revenue stream strategy but is missing the cost structure model because it's a brand new product that never existed on the market yet? How do you demonstrate a potential profit and evaluate the value of your company? Who would like to answer that? <laughs> I think from a cost perspective, the one thing what I would say is um, in order to grow your business and scale, there are gonna be, you, you should be able to sort of um, project out how much it will take in order to get your business from one point to the next. And when I, when I say that, I know that's a little vague, but it's, if you're gonna generate a certain level of revenue, it's going to take people to either sell it, people to build it. Um, th there are costs to that. that I, so I think even if it's new and novel, there is still an ability to put together kind of a, a cost structure, if you will, um, because ultimately, um, or one of the things um, investors will want to know is kind of what's the margin on what you're trying to build and sell, right? And, and that's important because unit economics for whatever it is, whether it be D2C or B2B or pick a thing, um, that's important, right? Because I will show how you're thinking about scaling the scaling the business and capturing that revenue, but in a ultimately at the end of the day, a profitable way down the road, right? So um, it, it, it's a little, call it an art, not necessarily a science, but it the, um, Investors will want you to think through that and, and say, it's not just like, you know, a billion dollar opportunity, but you know, here's a little bit of like the thought that I put into how I'm gonna get there. 
and what it's going to take because then they ask in terms of how much you want to raise is going to go directly against that right in terms of what you're trying to raise two million dollars or however much that may be the next question is okay what are these proceeds right so um that that's in terms of understanding that the, the cost structure is actually really important because it's going to back up and support um the conversations you're having with the teachers. Brilliant. Thank you, Kim, for uh, for talking through that. I don't know if Kathy or Danielle has anything further to add. Yeah, you know, I just add quickly that I think um, it, we we should all if we're going to ask somebody to invest in our company, we want to know for sure um, how much our costs are. As I guess a founder, forgetting that I'm involved with Sandpaper, I wanted to know exactly what my costs were. I may not have been able to. Um, be precise in the pricing structure or the pricing strategy I was going to undertake at a certain time. Um, but I think it's okay as long as you have a clear understanding of your costs and you make an attempt to say, look, this is my first uh, attempt at what the pricing strategy would be, but I'm really looking forward to your feedback and your and your your support on coming up with what my overall pricing strategy might be, because it might not necessarily be just about the price. It might be about the frequency that you're going to invoice. It might be about the frequency, uh, whether you're going to use a subscription model. Um, there's a lot that goes into a pricing strategy. So I think it's okay to ask for some mentorship at the seed stage, but it's not okay um, not to have an idea of your costs uh, in general, because that's how you can demonstrate your competency uh, as a founder. Uh, you know, that the money has got to come in, the money has got to go out. And those two simple pluses and minuses need to be something that you can speak to in your deck. Yeah, I would say, you know, this is a question that all early stage founders have to ask themselves because they are, on most cases, building something that's, that is net new to a market, right? Hopefully, if they're building something that at least 10x what the legacy systems are in order to gain market share. Um, from a revenue standpoint, I would also say, like, not all revenue is, is created equal. So, like, multiples for transactional revenue types or direct to consumer is lower than for SaaS or any other recurrent revenue structures. So there's a lot of variables in finding benchmarks and you know it's almost the same as what you would do in, in an investment banking scenario, right? But even more theoretical. And so just recognize that I'm just looking for you to actually build something that can 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 go into a conversation around the assumptions. Wonderful. All right. I think we've definitely got that on, that question answered. Some fantastic advice from each of our speakers. Um, I have one question that came in through the chat um, a few minutes ago from Lindsay asking for a little bit of clarity around um, what, what exactly is meant when a, a fund is for women in tech. Um, so Lindsay says, um, with their business, they use a state-of-the-art technology to help people with chronic pain, athletic performance, and burnout naturally. Um, they're at least the, the primary markets that they're currently working towards. Um, they use tech in the business. Um, so they're wondering, are they um, eligible for your types of funds? Or um, is there, you know strict parameters around, you know, what it means to, to be a woman in tech when it's um, for your funds. I think that mostly is for um, Kim, I guess, but Kathy as well. Yeah, I mean, I'll go quick, quick. We, we um, it, there has to be a tech component um, and the technology has to be newly created and it has to be scalable. So if it's a technology that you're using in one location that is only restricted that location and you're not, you don't have um, a view to grow, um, that, that wouldn't necessarily be something that we would um, be interested in. The other thing I'd say too, though, is that sometimes um, you know, we may be pitched, um, I hate that word, uh, we may be uh, presented a relationship opportunity to meet a founder who has developed a really cool idea um, from a technology perspective that helps uh, support the business idea they have. But if we don't feel that we can add real meaningful operator value to them growing their company, then we'll often um, you know, suggest the founder look for a more strategic investor. So just because a venture capital firm identifies that tech or health tech or climate tech is something that they're focused on, remember that they may have certain nuances inside that investment thesis when it comes to the team that they would bring uh, to bear uh, to support uh, their investment, and more importantly, to support you as a founder to grow your company. Yeah, 
we're, we're similar to Kathy and how she kind of described um, new technology, novel technology um, that's really solving the problem, um, whatever that problem may be at hand. Um, and so that's how we look at it from a, from a technology perspective. And I just jump in like, so we have both the fund and the angel network. So from the funds perspective, um, we look at women entrepreneurs who have equitable equity to their other co-founders. So a subject to a conversation between the general partners, we also, we're just looking for companies to not have like, you know, we're bringing on a female founder later on in their process and saying that they have a co-founder. Um, and then from the angel network, we really have a broad definition and each angel can define that for themselves. So they've essentially expressed an interest in supporting other uh, women and they want to invest specifically in women entrepreneurs. But as they dig into the conversation and the relationship, they can define that for themselves. And I think that enables kind of just a early comfort zone and space around those kinds of conversations to bring in maybe founders that may be overlooked. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you all for answering that. Lindsay, I hope that uh, answers your question. Um, so I'm just going to go back to some of our planned questions as we get maybe a few more uh, in there. Um, I'd love to talk about um, how you're each evaluating the potential of women-led businesses um, to succeed and grow. I, I think uh, you've each talked about um, there's a little bit in, during the conversation, but Kim, I know you talked about um, looking at who is actually running the business as well, like very much on the team. Um, so yeah, what, what are the specific things you're looking out for when um, a company presents? Uh, I won't use the word pitch, Kathy. Um, pre either yeah, presents or, or uh, reaches out to, to you. Um, yeah, Kim, I'll go to you first. Sure, I'm happy to start. I, I think it's it's not a checklist. I think it's it's a lot of stuff, right? Because then it's everything together and how that uh, how that how that kind of all hangs together, if you will. Um, certainly, the team is really important. These are the folks that are going to build, grow, sell. Um, so, understanding the market, understanding the product, what does the customer want? I mean, those are really important um, attributes that we look for um, in the team. And then I I would you know also say huge potential right potential in terms of market opportunity in terms of the problem that's being solved in terms of the market they're going after um and and the, the product is important don't get me wrong but i think like we've seen uh and canada has certainly seen you know lots of great products that somehow just get you know beat up by inferior products from somewhere else in the world and and it's not because the product's not great. It's like making sure we have the right team behind it to really support um, and and get after it, if you will, and, and you know have that level of grit that is sometimes hard to find. But but I think that the team's really important because ultimately it's it's their vision, it's their strategy. That's who we're backing. You know, we're not in there to go step in and, and do their jobs because um, you you don't want me doing that. Like I will tell you 100 uh, percent, I should not be running your business. You should be running your business and. That's who um, that's who we're looking for, um, and but but obviously like with a whole up, a whole other kind of set in terms of what your go to market is, what the market opportunity is, um, but but I think um, it's it's just so fundamental, especially you know early stage when you're looking at building a business in a you know a really noisy a noisy market. How do you stand out? So those are one of the, it's important. It's not the be all end all, but it's certainly a big. Okay, Danielle, how about how about yourself? Anything specific you're kind of looking for? Yeah, I'm trying to avoid saying anything too cliche. <laughs> um, like, you know, you want problem solvers. You want incredibly intelligent, hardworking people who are going to have the emotional intelligence to get the buy-in from community, right? You're starting something net new. It's not sitting at a desk job doing something that everyone else is doing. So you really also have to have those kind of elements of, um, you know, wherewithal for implementation. And so uh, a couple of red flags for me when founders are, are presenting where they're saying things like, um, you know, we own the patent, so we own the space, or this idea is huge and it's going to be huge. And it's just like kind of things like that are indicators to me that they're not all about execution and implementation. They're not about the journey 
Like they're not about the fact that they they need to bring this product to market. And the, there's a million great ideas sitting on shelves. And so I think that's really where they're looking for, you know, those cliche things that people say around like hustle and hutzpah and everything. And you're like, well, what does that really mean? And so I think those are some of the indicators where, you know, I like to know founders before they're just at that last stage of trying to get some money in the door. I want to know them before then so I can see their work in, in, in action. Love that, Danielle. Uh, Kathy, how about yourself? Um, well, I think, you know, I mentioned earlier that we're looking for scalable, you know, tech enabled solutions that are going to be, that have global potential. Um, when it comes to the founders, um, you know, like uh, both uh, my colleagues here today, you know, we will check your cap table to make sure that uh, you've been there for a while. Uh, we're hoping that you're the first, uh, that, you're, you know, it's your idea that uh, is coming to us, but we have invested in companies that have um, you know, uh, a female at the C-suite and a senior level that owns a significant piece of the company. Um, and we're also looking for um, companies where, as I said earlier, we know we can add, add value because, you know, the partnership with Sandpiper, we have three general partners. The three of us are the investment committee and make the ultimate decisions supported by our deal team folks. And um, we want to make sure that we can not only bring some capital to your company to help you grow, but that we can also um, resonate with maybe some challenges that you're facing as a founder and that there's some things that we can bring, uh, bring to the table to help. Um, so, you know, really honest conversations about how um, you want your investors to work with you um, and where the challenges are are valuable in our conversations. Um, and likewise, too, um, we're looking for, you know, founders who um, have um, an ambition um, that is uh, for that global, that global growth, because we're very clear with our investors when we take their capital, um, that that's what we're looking for. And we want to make sure that those folks that we invest in are reflecting that ambition uh, that we are promising our investors. All right. Thank you. I'm um, sorry. I'm, I'm, while I'm listening to you guys, I'm also ensuring that I'm um, collecting all the different questions that i um, the attendees are asking. Um, so to do, there, I, there have been a few questions, I, I assume directed towards me in terms of the information in the chat. Um, I think that some people are having issues with copying and pasting what's in the chat. So any links um, that have been shared or any resources that have been shared, we will package these together and they'll be in our next Startup Women newsletter. And um, so we'll we'll share a link on how you can um, subscribe to that newsletter. Um, but if, if there's anything that you've missed, don't worry, we will sort of put it together for you in uh, that newsletter. Um, and the recording as well will be on our YouTube channel on our Facebook page as well. So we have you covered on, on all those points. Um, I, I'm curious to know of any um, success stories that maybe each of you can share um, on businesses that you've uh, funded in the past or, you know, worked with. Um, what kind of impact or growth have you seen um, on them through uh, your, each of your funds? Um, Kathy, can I go to you first? Yeah, and I, and I hope I'm not a, a Debbie Downer on the, on the, uh, the restriction I'm going to put on my answer. Um, without breaking the confidence of our individual portfolio companies, I'll share generally um, that, you know, we've seen um, uh, founders who have been very successful in not only raising capital, but more importantly, growing their sales in a short period of time. And they've typically done that by being very focused in a particular channel area. Um, and I think what we're seeing um, in some of our uh, companies in particular, um, they're being recognized for that effort by winning um, you know, a tremendous number of these early stage um, you know, pitch sessions where folks can get a check. Um, so non-dilutive capital through that, uh, through that mechanism is a really valuable uh, thing at the early stage, um, but it's not the only litmus test of success. I mean, ultimately, the success comes to, you know, how can you sell? Um, how much can you sell? And can you make a profit from what you're selling? Um, and we're pleased to say that the companies that we're working with have all shown that they can, or they're getting close to that, um, because we want to set them up for success for that next um, investor who's going to join us um, at the cap table as the company continues to grow. And, you know, Sam Piper moves from maybe um, sitting on the board 
of the company, which we often do. We're sitting as an observer and the board um, to standing on the sidelines when uh, you know the series, you know B, C, D investors invest in the company. We we want to make sure that they can demonstrate at a very early uh, age. Um, in their uh, corporate life, that they can drive those revenues in a way that's uh, going to get people excited. And that's that's great to hear. Definitely something to uh, to celebrate for sure. Uh, Danielle, anything? Anything? And again, um, yeah, I should have mentioned. Yeah, you can totally be general. You don't have to necessarily uh, speak, uh, say their name or, or company name. Yeah, I would say like uh, a recent success from our portfolio, you know, we did a pre-seed round and, and now she's raised a, a $5 million seed round with uh, a number of prominent institutional VCs in both Canada and the US. And so what I saw with her was her ability to, both from a customer standpoint and investor standpoint, and overall networking standpoint, never put all her eggs in one basket. So she was always leveraging multiple relationships, multiple conversations. Um, and and really expanding her network, making great impressions on everyone that she met, bringing her subject matter expertise to the table and her, and her authority around what she's aware of and what she knows and what she's capable of. And she, you know, was underestimated in, in many cases, but fundamentally is going to prove her business and prove her model. And so I think that confidence and that strength and that ability to not only have all of those conversations and not let anyone tell her what she does or doesn't know but also to be able to deliver that at the end of the day so um yeah i know it's a nuanced response but i think it's a really important thing even with fundraising or clients don't just say okay i've got this one client and this is going to be my make or break or i've got this one investor and i'm pushing hard on them always know that there's there's more people out there big world Great advice, absolutely. Um, Kim? Um, yeah, I, um, maybe what I'd add is something neat that we've been able to see through certainly the evolution of the first one and um, and now um, early on in, in Thrive is, um, is moving away, the ability uh, when you reach the point you can move away from solely founder-led sales and, and bringing on um, strong sales folks and then seeing that machine just work, it's, it's um, it's really awesome because you're at a point where that founder, um, they can't do everything at that point when they're trying to scale and letting go is always hard. Um, but you know, that finding, um, a team that can then take it on and then for the founder to be able to do a bunch of other stuff. Um, it, it's, a uh, it's really neat to see. It's really neat to see other folks empowered within the company. And then they present at pitch at, sorry, they present at, um, board meetings and the like, and, and you have like a management team presenting versus just like the founder or the CEO saying, okay, here's what we did. Um, she has a team. It's it's like it's it's really cool to see that because you get to be part of that evolution and 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 um, and it's not always a smooth path, but it's it's like you know one of those moments you're like oh my gosh it's it's so neat to see that you're making these like big steps like step functions in terms of where the business is going. So that's always really great to see, and we've been seeing that more and more. That's fantastic. I love that. Um, Kim, I want to keep it on you for a moment. Um, Joan asked. Does BDC Thrive Venture Fund support seeding as social innovations? I think it depends. So we it will depend in terms of the business again and, and what what that looks like. Um, I would need to know more, I guess, is kind of how I'm going to caveat the question. It depends. Um, I don't want to say yes or no, but it, it really does depend. There's a ton of stuff that we've seen that um, is kind of, you know, double impact, triple impact that still generates return. Um, ultimately, at the end of the day, we are structured like an institutional fund and we have returns and hurdle rates um, to achieve. And that's really important that uh, we're able to return the fund plus, 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 as we like to say, um, back to our shareholder. Um, so so I, I guess I'm giving a really not great non-answer, but uh, <laughs> I'm happy to chat and connect with you after if you would like to talk some more. Brilliant. Yeah. And yeah, so to each of our speakers, um, before we wrap up, if you're happy with people connecting with you, we have shared uh, your LinkedIn's, your LinkedIn URLs to um, the chat. But um, yeah, if there's any other ways that people can connect with you, of course, if you're comfortable with it. Um, otherwise, people can connect with you through uh, your LinkedIn. So to wrap up the conversation, um, any final piece of advice for any women identifying entrepreneurs that are just starting this process? Kathy, maybe I go to you first. Um, I think, um, you know, get ready for um, 
um, an exciting group of conversations. Get ready for everything that you expect to be that uh, you know potentially could be negative that may also happen. Meaning that you know not all investors are um, uh, see women as investors as founders the same way. Um, you know you'll likely get more questions about risk versus getting questions about growth and try to figure out a way to push the conversation back to growth as opposed to risk. Uh, we know that there's all kinds of biases in how uh, folks ask you questions. So if you understand those biases, you can you know, manage the conversation uh, to your advantage. Um, and I guess, you know, just bring your authentic self. You know, there's amazing women who are coming up with incredible ideas in healthcare and technology and climate. Um, and, you know, there's a group of folks um, like many who are in this uh, virtual uh, discussion today who are want to, wanting to rally behind you, maybe with capital, hopefully, um, but certainly with uh, cheering from the sidelines and uh, keep your confidence up because it's a it's a tough road, but one that's worth it when you actually close the round and you can start focusing on those milestones and get your company to the next level. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kathy. Danielle? Yeah, I would say, you know, a lot of this is, is focused on fundraising. So I'll, I'll just say building a strong foundation to ensure and maximize the potential for a successful fundraise, you know, from everything from like, who is your team, who are your key hires to the finances that you're putting in and, and the detailed documentation for your, you know, com completing that long checklist, right, to prepare for fundraising. So um, what I would put at the top of that list would be, a robust financial model that includes thoughtful growth projections uh, and then multiple future scenarios so that as you're being asked questions, you come across as professional and prepared to be able to address any potential concerns. So I think like that's just concrete advice, you're not anything um, you know more inspiring, but I hope that helps. Absolutely, thank you. And, and Kim, to wrap us up. Um, oh gosh, that's <laughs> not as what I wanted. Um, no, I was going to say it is a journey. Um, I think what Kathy mentioned a little bit earlier was practice your pitch. You're going to be talking to a lot of folks, like a lot of people. Um, but the more times you have the conversation, the less kind of nerve wracking it is. And you're going to know the numbers like on the back, like just closing with your eyes closed and you'll know which slide has what piece of information. and make sure you know the key points that you want to get across in, in that presentation to an investor. Um, what do you want them to walk away with? Um, even if they're not ready to fund right now or you're not ready for them or whatever the case may be. Um, and and really, um, yeah, control, like you should control the conversation because you're the one who's pitching your idea or talking about your company and why you're going to solve this amazing thing. Um, and the person on the other side is just asking questions to get more knowledgeable about it. But but ultimately, um, it's a it's a conversation that um, should be also fun because you get to tell people like why you're doing this and why you're so excited about it. And that comes through in a conversation. Um, you get that energy, but even if it's for in, on Zoom and virtual or in person or at a coffee shop, um, people can get excited if you're excited too. So it's it, it's it's um it's really. It's actually really fun. We love talking to entrepreneurs, even if it's just to, to meet them um, and they're early in their journey, um, because that's like the fun part of my job, if you call it a job. So, love that. No, thank you. The solid advice from all of you, Kim. I I resonate with the you know you control the conversation. I think that that's a really empowering a piece of advice for for an entrepreneur to go into those uh, conversations. And um, so I know we are just on time. So. Before I do my sort of closing remarks, I have a very quick feedback poll for our attendees. I would love to know how your experience was. I am always looking for ways to improve um, uh, your experience for these. Thank you so much to Kathy, Danielle and Kimberly for donating your time and expertise for today's uh, conversation. I've certainly learned a lot. So I'm hoping that our attendees have also um, taken away some nuggets of gold as well. Um, our next webinar for this program is how to build customer trust with solid brand strategy, and that's happening on May 31st. We'll share information um, with a link in the chat um, as well. 
And um, so hopefully see you there. If you have any questions at all about our program, please feel free to reach out to me as well on LinkedIn. Um, but thank you so much for attending today's session and I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Great job, Isabel. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Oh, it's just up again. Okay, thanks, Isabel. Really great job.